Howdy students, we're entering into chapter four in our evolution textbook. Chapter four is titled, The Tree of Life, How Biologists Use Phylogeny to Reconstruct the Deep Past. So the opening story in this chapter highlights Steve Broussat, a paleontologist uh, who has been studying fossils for years to uh, answer questions about the history of life. Uh, one of the fossils, uh, one of the more recent fossil discoveries that he's been involved with uh, comes out of China. In fact, China has a lot of recent uh, pivotal fossil discoveries. So the uh, dinosaur that's shown here, the tongue twisting name Zenionlong, uh, was uh, dated at 125 million years old. And the value of this dinosaur skeleton and finding this fossil is that it helps to answer questions about not just dinosaur evolution, but bird evolution. This dinosaur, as a matter of fact, had a number of different kinds of feathers on its body. So this uh, fossil, as well as others like it, uh, show us that feathers evolved not for flying, perhaps, but for other functions, since this dinosaur was not able to fly. So this uh, uh, fossil has been included into the uh, evolutionary history of birds and dinosaurs to help us understand uh, that history a little better. And that's a big part of what this chapter is about. Uh, it highlights how to interpret an evolutionary tree or cladogram, how to build evolutionary trees or cladograms, uh, the importance of fossils in uh, including them in these sorts of analyses, uh, and how we use uh, evolutionary trees or phylogenetic uh, trees to answer questions about the biology of living organisms and uh, their history. So if phylogeny is an evolutionary history of a lineage. And we take phylogeny as being real. It exists. There is a history of life on this earth and we all belong to one big family tree. So this phylogeny indeed is out there. And as biologists, we endeavor to discover it to understand it. And that's a big challenge because we weren't around to watch this phylogeny unfold. We are relatively uh, relative newcomers to planet Earth. So we have to use the tools that we have. We have to use the understanding we have about evolution and be creative uh, to um, reconstruct this phylogeny, this evolutionary history. Of life. So when we take a look at a diagram uh, like the one on the left side of your page, this uh, branching diagram we call a cladogram, uh, it shows uh, these branches and the lines that are uh, in these branches. So the question here is what do these lines in the diagram represent? And these lines represent lineages. A lineage is a sequence of ancestors giving rise to descendants. You belong to your own family lineage. Your grandparents gave rise to your parents. They gave rise to you. Grandparents also gave rise to aunts and uncles. They gave rise to cousins. So you have this recent family tree that you belong to. Well, the species on earth belong to bigger family trees, evolutionary trees, and these lines represent those lineages, those sequences of ancestors and descendants. Take a look at the far left part of the figure diagram. It's, it's uh, zooming in and really breaking down how to envision, how to think about uh, what these lines represent, what these lineages represent. So if you go backwards from the bottom of the figure on the far left of your slide, it shows the cladogram. 
It shows how species B and C are close relatives, species A is the next closest relative of them, etc. Uh, if we start to zoom in on those branches and try to understand and envision what they are, well, they're made up of um, populations. And that's when we start looking at like part E of the figure, we're starting to see this, uh, this, these networks of populations that are interconnected through gene flow. Uh, then we look at part D, okay, in that diagram, and it's zooming in on one population and showing all the interconnections of organisms mating and reproducing and giving rise to offspring. So it's a whole network of organisms interacting and reproducing. Uh, then we look up at part C, and now we're seeing the individual organisms that are interacting generation after generation. If we work our way all the way to the top of the diagram, then we finally see, yes, uh, these populations are made up of uh, individual organisms like butterflies. So there's a lot to think about. There's a lot to wrap your brain around in looking at a cladogram or evolutionary tree and having a concept of what it's showing you. Now, the title of this slide, Tree Thinking, I want to say something before I move on to the next one. So thinking about the relationships of life on Earth as being part of one big genetic tree or evolutionary tree, this is part of what we refer to as tree thinking. Thinking about biology, thinking about the connections of life in a tree-like manner. And this framework of tree thinking helps to direct our questioning and our hypothesis formation about the evolution of life. So it's sort of a philosophy. It's sort of a strategy, tree thinking, and how to approach uh, asking and answering questions about evolution. So let's take a little bit of time here and review how to read a phylogenetic tree how to interpret a phylogenetic tree. So let's begin with the figure uh, that's on the far left, figure A, part A of this figure. It's showing you this branching diagram uh, with lineages, uh, the lines, and different colors to represent the different lineages. So uh, one thing to go over here is what is a phylogeny? So I've already defined that. It's basically an evolutionary tree. It's the evolutionary history of a group of species, a lineage. I've already gone over what the lines represent, the, the lineages that make up this tree. Uh, let's now get to the, the uh, question of what a node is. So look at that uh, figure A and look how there are arrows pointing to nodes. So the nodes are the places or the points where the branches are connecting. Just like on an actual tree where branches connect at what botanists call nodes and forming bigger branches. Now these nodes represent something very important in these uh, trees. They represent shared common ancestors. So if you look at, say, the orangish yellow part of that cladogram, there's two branches to it. If you follow those two branches down to the node that those branches share, that node represents a common ancestral species that those two orangish yellow branches share. You could uh, point to any of the other branches and nodes in the uh, same cladogram or different cladograms, they represent the same things. Now, what do the tips of these branching diagrams represent? The very tips. The very tips represent the, the taxa, uh, the named lineages, perhaps the species that we're showing in these diagrams. What, does a clay, what is a clade? What is a clade? A clade is a, is a term for what's also known as a monophyletic group. We're going to take a look at that in a, a couple slides here. And a clade is a group that includes a common ancestor and all of its descendants. 
that is a clade. So if you look at that figure A, uh, the two branches that are orangish yellow, uh, they connect at that node, they form a clade. That group would include the common ancestor, the little dot at that node, and then the descendants, those two branches. If you go farther down and you see now the purple node, there's an arrow pointing to it. If you uh, put a bracket around the group that includes that purple node and all of its descendants, the purple branches and the orange branches, that would also be a clade. And then finally, that diagram is showing an even bigger clade with the blue node. So uh, that's what a clade is, and clades are what biologists name. So, for example, when you hear the scientific name mammalia for the mammals, that is a name for a clade uh, in the tree of life that includes the animals we call mammals. When you hear the name amphibia, that also is a clade in the tree of life that includes a common ancestor and all the descendants, the frogs and the salamanders and the Sicilians. Okay, the other thing on this uh, slide that I have a question mark about is what do the forks represent? So, for example, when you look at a node and then the branches that come from that node, that's what I'm referring to as a, as a fork. So here's the node down here. The branches are connecting to it. And so what does the fork represent? The fork represents a speciation event. It represents that that ancestor has split into two different lineages. Uh, and those two independently evolving lineages uh, would represent different species. So the fork represents the origin or formation of new species. All right, so there's quite a bit there to go over and make sure you understand about the parts of a cladogram and how to interpret them. Now look in part B. So the first part of part B on the left hand side is showing an unrooted network. So it's showing how, you know, these different species can be connected, but it doesn't particularly show, um, you know, what kind of ancestor they come from. But the other uh, diagrams in part B are all showing rooted trees. So showing uh, a common ancestor of the whole group. Anyway, a big part of uh, figure B is showing how those branches can be rotated around and uh, uh, placed in different parts of the tree, but they still represent the same hypothesis of evolutionary relationships. Take a look at the very first diagram uh, that's shown there. It shows the purple lineages uh, related to the orange lineages. Now look at the uh, next diagram next to it, to the right, it also shows the purple lineages uh, connected or related to the orange lineages, but they've been rotated down uh, to the bottom part of that diagram. Uh, so there's a couple ways that the lineages have been rotated around, kind of like uh, um, uh, parts of a mobile hanging down from a ceiling and spinning around from common connection points. So that is what's being represented in part B is how the lineages can be rotated around at the nodes and it still shows the same relationships. The last point here is on the bottom of this slide, the figures that are going across just simply show different ways that biologists represent evolutionary trees, different kinds of diagrams, different kinds of, of branching um, styles, but, but they're all depicting the same concept, how different species are related and how they share common ancestors. So here is a figure out of your textbook, the next one up here, uh, showing these two cladograms, these two evolutionary trees, and how different uh, lineages are related. So there's Charles Darwin in the figure A showing he is most closely related to a cat. We are all mammals. Uh, showing a lizard being most closely related to a bird. They are reptiles. Uh, the lizard and the bird together form a clade. And if you follow that branch down to 
the node that is shared with the mammals, um, it's showing that relationship. The reptiles, the lizard and the bird are most, most closely related to the mammals. Uh, now, the figure B, does it show identical or different phylogenetic relationships? So if you look closely at B, you can see that Charles Darwin is depicted as the closest relative to the cat. Okay, so that's the same as figure A. You can see that the lizard is depicted as most closely related to the bird. It's the same as A. You can see that those two lineages, the lizard bird and the mammal lineage, are then connected at a node, same as figure A, etc. So when you scrutinize the two figures like this, you can see that they are the same hypothesis. They are showing the same relationships among species. It's just that the lineages or the lines have been rotated around the nodes to be pointing in different directions. That's it. And that's perfectly fine. Biologists can draw these lines going whatever directions they want. What's important is how the lines are connected at the nodes. That's how to read these diagrams. What we're seeing here is there are different reasons to condense the lineages down in a cladogram, uh, maybe to exclude some, uh, maybe to collapse the lineages. Let me go over this. So what does figure A show? So figure A shows a complete phylogeny of species A through G and how they're related. So A, B, and C form a clade. Uh, D and E form a clade. Uh, F and G form a clade, etc. So somebody might want to, for whatever reason, simplify that diagram, maybe for the, a, a point of, of uh, talking about the evolution of some characteristic in each of these clades. So you can see the red arrow going over to the right, and then we just have species B. Species B is being used as a representative of that clade, saying, okay, just we don't need to look at all three species, A, B, and C. B can be a representative. Likewise, E is a representative of the D and E clade. So that's what part A is showing you. So, for example, if we had a, a cladogram that uh, showed the evolutionary relationships of different mammal lineages, uh, of which there's many different types, carnivores and bats and rodents and primates, we might use Homo sapiens as a representative of just the primate lineage. So instead of showing all the different species of primates and how they're related in a bigger mammal cladogram, we would just use, say, Homo sapiens as the lineage to represent primates. On the bottom of the slide, figure B, what is this showing? What it's showing is that we might uh, collapse all the species in a clade into one lineage and just name that whole lineage or that whole clade. Again, it's a way of simplifying. It's sort of stepping back and showing the bigger picture. So instead of showing all of species D, E, F, and G, we we'll collapse them all and just name that whole clade, that whole group, you know, H give it a name, of course, in reality, but we're just represent, representing it here by the letter H. Likewise, we might take that uh, clade for A, B, and C, and it's not showing it in the diagram, but say collapse that one and just call it like I, you know, clade I. So different ways to represent these cladograms depending on what we want to show, what we want to communicate to others. So here we're looking at the relationship between phylogeny and taxonomy. You might remember that taxonomy is the system of how we, we name species and bigger groups of species. And those uh, formally scientifically named groups of species are called taxa. So taxonomy is a system for naming clades, for naming taxa. <clears throat> so 
we get these names uh, or we give groups of species names by first figuring out the phylogeny, first coming up with a hypothesis of who's related to who. So take a look at the diagram to the right. It's showing you, again, the cat and Charles Darwin, human, are most closely related. And uh, so they form a clade. And we have hair and milk, for example, as unique characteristics that show that we are closely related. We have those characteristics from a, a common ancestor. So we want to name that group that includes the cat and humans, Darwin. So we give that group the name Mammalia. That is the accepted scientific name or taxonomic name. Then we've got that group that includes the lizard and the bird. And uh, we give that group a name, amniotes. This way we can communicate with each other as biologists and we can talk about the different branches or lineages in the tree of life using these names that are accepted around the world by all biologists of all cultures and all languages. That's the big value of having these common scientific names. And this is where the names are coming from. Once again, we are naming the clades. We are naming Let's move into this, the monophyletic groups. We're not naming poly or paraphyletic groups. We don't regard those as being natural evolutionary groupings, but monophyletic groups or clades are. They are objective individuals that include a common ancestor and all the descendants of that ancestor. So if you look at the diagram on the bottom, especially the bottom left, it's showing you that uh, boxed off blue area that includes the cat and Darwin, that's a clade, that's a monophyletic group. So that's a group that includes a common ancestor and all the descendants as shown in that diagram. Likewise, the lizard and the bird would form a clade. Okay, The lizard, bird, cat, and human would form a clade or monophyletic group. So uh, now what's a paraphyletic group? Make sure you get down this definition. A paraphyletic group includes a common ancestor, but it leaves out one or more of the descendants of that common ancestor. So if you look at figure B, the middle one, we've got kind of a pink shaded group that includes a lizard, the bird, and the cat, and their common ancestor, but it's left out Charles Darwin. It's left out humans. And since we know that humans are part of that clade, uh, but we've left them out, um, then that, that is what makes it a paraphyletic group. We don't name those kinds of groups. We wouldn't name a group that includes those three lineages but leaves out humans. Your book talks about how if you, uh, you know, had a diagram like this on a piece of paper, with a monophyletic group, you just need to cut or snip the lineage or the line in one place and you've got your group. For a para or polyphyletic group, you'd have to cut or snip the lines, you know, the scissors, in two or more places in order to make the group. So you'd have to cut below the node that includes the lizard and the bird, the cat and Darwin, but you'd also have to cut out the lineage that includes Darwin. So you'd be cutting in two places. That can't be a monophyletic group. Finally, a polyphyletic group includes uh, multiple species, but doesn't include their common ancestor. So uh, yeah, that's the most extreme case. And uh, we rarely see any instances of uh, groups being polyphyletic. And if they are, biologists correct that mistake by renaming the groups. So I just went over with you how taxonomy, how our system of names is based on phylogeny, on our understanding of evolutionary relationships. So we figure out phylogeny first, and then we name the groups that we see in our evolutionary trees. Now, of course, this is all subject to change. Phylogenies or cladograms are considered hypotheses. They are explanations for the distribution of data, the distribution of characteristics among species. So we're explaining 
why it is that species share characteristics. We're explaining that by showing an evolutionary tree or diagram and where those characteristics evolved and how they got passed on. So cladograms are hypotheses and they can be modified. They are tentative like every other hypothesis. So as we've learned more about evolutionary history by say, collecting more data, sequencing DNA, finding more fossils, uh, whatever, then we might revise our phylogenies. We might revise how we think of things as being related. And if we do that, then we're going to need to revise our taxonomy. We're going to need to revise our naming system. So let's use the diagram here as an example. So years ago, Linnaeus uh, named the group Reptilia. That includes lizards, snakes, turtles, um, alligators, crocodiles, and he left out the birds. He put the birds in a different group and called them aves. They looked so dramatically different from the rest of these reptiles that he figured that God created them as distinct groups and he you know, named them separately. Uh, but in the 20th century, as we started thinking and looking at things through the lens of evolution and coming up with better ideas of the uh, evolutionary history of life, we began to look at these diagrams and go, hey, wait a minute. Because birds are uh, part of the, the reptilia, you know, the reptilia is depicted in figure A is paraphyletic. It includes a common ancestor, but it's not including all the descendants. Birds or aves are one of the descendants of the ancestors of reptiles. So we need to include the birds, the aves, within the reptilia. That would be a way to correct the, the error of having reptilia being paraphyletic. We just simply include the birds, that's in figure B, and now the reptilia is monophyletic. Now we have named and identified a monophyletic group. These kinds of changes have happened several times uh, over time. Uh, like we don't even uh, recognize the name Pisces anymore. Uh, that was a name long ago. Pisces was just for fish. Well, some fish are more closely related to uh, land-dwelling vertebrates like us than they are to other fish. So got rid of that name. I've just talked about the example of reptilia. We just had to modify who we were including in reptilia, the birds, to make it monophyletic. And of course, there's other examples. So we've talked now about what a phylogeny is. We've talked about, I've talked about how to interpret a phylogeny, how to look at these diagrams and understand what they're showing. Asking my dog to not bark. Money, come in. Come on. Okay, I'll carry on. So this is going over the steps of how we come up with a phylogeny. It's very time intensive and very laborious, but it's fun. <laughs> we first need to identify characters and character states by carefully observing specimens. The characteristics, the characters and the character states that organisms have are a result of genetics and evolution. Uh, different species, so a character state is a different version of a character, different versions. So for example, if you look at the um, teeth of a carnivore, uh, some of their um, Teeth are modified into what are called carnassials. They're molars or carnassials. So they're like shaving teeth, they're slicing teeth, and those are uh, unique to the carnivores. So if we look at mammals more broadly, we don't have, if you look in our mouth, we have molars, but we don't have carnassials. So as a, a character and character states, the character might be type of molar and the character states might be flat molar and carnassial molar. So those would be different versions. So we're carefully identifying characters and then the different versions of them called character states. It takes a lot of time. 
But if you look carefully at the, the uh, data matrix that's on the left-hand side of the slide, it shows you a column of characters, complexity of the cooling surfaces in the nose, those are called maxilloturbinals, and then uh, some mammals have minimally branched ones and some have highly branched ones. So those would be character states, different versions of that um, characteristic. Number two, bony spur by the auditory bola. The auditory bola is in the back of the skull. That's where the ears are located. So it's saying uh, some mammals have a straight and projecting bony spur. That is one condition. And others have a, have a cup around the auditory bola. That's another condition. So you could continue looking down through that character matrix and see the different characters and the different versions. So we need to uh, uh, use computer programs for figuring out phylogenetic relationships. And so when we input the data into computer programs, uh, typically we use numbers, zeros, ones, twos, threes, etc., to represent different character states. And so uh, states uh, that are um, deemed to be ancestral, to have to already exist in the lineage that we're studying, uh, to have existed before the lineage that we're studying came into existence, those are called ancestral. So if we want to look at what the evolutionary relationships of the carnivores are, we need to look at a close relative to the carnivores to see what the ancestral state is, to see what the earlier version state is. And so in this example, lemur, a type of primate, is being used as what's called the outgroup, the uh, lineage just outside the group we're studying. And so we assign zeros to what the lemur has for the character states, those that be depicted as the earlier existing condition. And then anything that's different from that uh, within the carnivore group is going to be given a one or a two. But in this case, there's just zeros and ones when you look at the diagram. So this sets up our data matrix to uh, be analyzed and to start putting branches together and figuring out how the species are related. Zeros represent the ancestral state. And that is determined by looking at one or more outgroups, lineages that are outside our group of study. So for all these species of carnivores that were depicted on the last slide in the data matrix, bears, otters, raccoons, dogs, seals, walruses, cats, etc., uh, we can do our phylogenetic analysis and like I said, we're most commonly using computer programs to help us do this. And the reason why we need to use computer programs is because there are so many different possibilities or arrangements that we have to compare to find the most likely one. In fact, for this group of species, for this number of species in our analysis, if you look at the bottom of the slide here, there's over 34 million possible arrangements for how the branches can be connected. We need a way for whittling these, these arrangements down and come up with what we think is the most likely arrangement for how the species are related. So, for example, in figure A, there's one outcome of doing the analysis for the computer program, and it shows 12 evolutionary steps. So those little colored marks that are on the branches show transitions. They show points where a character state is evolving to be something unique in this group, in this lineage. So, for example, character number one, complexity of the cooling surfaces in the nose, the maxilloturbinals. You can see character one down on the bottom of figure A. It's that little reddish mark. And so that's saying that that lineage that includes dogs and raccoons and otters, that clade, they have uh, the unique condition of having highly branched maxinoturbinals. That clade also has the unique condition of character five, a bone within the penis, a baculum. 
So there are two unique character states in this diagram that support the uh, hypothesis that all those species are related to each other. And uh, so if you count up the total number of little marks on that tree, there are 12 little marks. There are 12 steps to this cladogram. If you look at the other cladograms in this figure, there are different numbers of steps to these cladograms. One of them has, uh, can't quite see, oh, B has 24 steps, C has 20 steps, D has 21 steps, and the branches are arranged in different ways. So how do we decide which of these diagrams is the most likely one? Which is the diagram that we're going to settle in on as the hypothesis that we're going to accept for the relationships? Well, we use the principle of parsimony. So we have to ask ourselves, which of these trees is the most parsimonious? The principle of parsimony says that the simplest hypothesis is the most likely hypothesis. That's the principle of parsimony. And we use this principle all the time in science and in our everyday lives. Let's imagine two investigators arrived at a crime scene. Somebody has been shot and killed inside an apartment. And they want to know perhaps how many suspects to look for. So one of the partners says, oh, I think we should be looking for three suspects here. That's the hypothesis of how many suspects to look for. But his partner, thinking parsimoniously, says, hey, wait a minute, Bob. There's only one set of fingerprints on the doorknob. And uh, so one set of fingerprints, that doesn't imply more than one person. Also, there's just one bullet hole uh, that killed this guy. So one bullet implies perhaps one person. Okay. Oh, and look at the floor. Here's a set of footprints from them walking around. There's only one set of footprints from shoes here. So all of these indicators suggest that we should just be looking for one suspect, not three. That one suspect is more parsimonious. It's the simplest explanation. So in using the principle of parsimony here, we choose the evolutionary tree, the cladogram that has the fewest number of steps. And here that would be figure A that has 12 steps. The other figures have more what we call homoplasy. They have more transitions, the evolution of the same character state more than once in different lineages. So for example, if you look down at figure C in the diagram, you can show at the very root of the cladogram, at the bottom of the cladogram, it shows character one is evolving to the derived or new state. Um, but you can also see character one farther up in the cladogram. It shows it's actually reversing. It's going back to the original condition. So there's two changes in character one, whereas figure A is only showing one change. So one change is more parsimonious, is more simple than two changes. And so that is the principle of parsimony. And if we have instances in a cladogram where a characteristic, say, evolves more than once, that's the simplest arrangement that we get, is it evolves more than once, then that is an example of homoplasy. It means that there's similarity in these species on different parts of the cladogram, and that similarity came from different ancestors, not a common ancestor. That's called homoplasy. And there's two kinds, primary kinds of homoplasy. There is convergent evolution. That's where lineages evolve to the same characteristic, like insects and birds and bats all evolving wings separately. They've converged upon that same condition. And then there's reversals. Reversals are situations where a characteristic evolves early in a lineage, and then later on, farther up the lineage, farther along in time, the characteristic reverses and disappears. That would be like snakes losing legs when their earlier ancestors had evolved legs. That's a reversal. So when we end up with a cladogram, the shortest one, it's very likely, uh, very common to have some level of homoplasy, 
some level of convergence and reversal in our shortest cladogram, our most parsimonious cladogram. So what do we do, though, if we do a phylogenetic analysis and we find that there are multiple cladograms that have the same number of steps? They are equally parsimonious. So look at figure A on your slide here. It's showing you three equally parsimonious trees or cladograms for the carnivores. And this is a result of expanding the analysis from 12 characters up to 20 characters. So we do the analysis, we put all this data into the computer with the zeros and the ones, and we find these three equally likely trees, equally parsimonious. Well, what do we do about that? One thing that biologists do is draw what's called a consensus tree. So a consensus tree is the one that is depicting all the common parts of the different cladograms, the different hypotheses. And uh, so it's showing the areas of agreement in the three trees. So for example, all three trees show that cats, hyenas, and civets form a clade. You can see that looking carefully at the diagram with cats and hyenas being more closely related to each other. So in our consensus tree, since all three of the blue trees up above show that same arrangement, we show that arrangement in the consensus tree. It's something they all have in common. But look down in that consensus tree. You can see raccoons, bears, otters, and then that bottom lineage are all coming from the same node. Like all four of them branching from the same node. So that's the consensus, because if you look at the top cladograms, there's different branching arrangements for those lineages, raccoons, bears, otters. There's disagreements in those three blue cladograms on the top among those species. So by drawing it that way on figure B, that's the consensus. That is the agreement. Now, the final point here is that when you have a cladogram that shows three or more lineages coming from the same node, so three coming from the same node, branching, that is called a polytomy. That's the word, that's the language, it's called a polytomy. So in that figure B, where you see raccoons, bears, otters, and that lineage with seals, walruses, and sea lions, they're all coming from the same node, that's a polytomy. So your textbook sometimes has inset boxes in your chapters, and those boxes go into more detail on certain topics or concepts, uh, teasing them apart and uh, a lot more intricately. Sometimes I avoid those boxes going into some topic that I don't want to go into in that much detail, so I avoid it. Other times I talk about them. So here's a case where I'm talking about one of the boxes here in chapter uh, four, and it's the box that's talking about the independent phylogenetic contrasts method, searching for patterns in trees. So this is commonly used in biology to look for patterns, to look for correlations once we have a cladogram, once we have a hypothesis, and seeing if there's correlations between certain uh, traits or characteristics that might be important. So this is a statistical method for identifying correlations that are phylogenetically independent phylogenetically independent. So we're coming up with explanations for the patterns of characteristics, uh, explanations other than, than common ancestry. So take a look at these two cladograms that are, well, it's really one cladogram that's shown on the top of your figure because they're showing that both species A and B are related to each other, C and D are each other's closest relatives, we call them sister taxa. Both figure A and figure B are showing the same arrangement of species. But look at figure A, saying, okay, species A is large, species B is small. And then we also look at the extinction risk for these species. We have some way to measure that. And we say, oh, 
Species A has a high risk, species B has a low risk. And we go through this cladogram and we, ass we assign the size of the animals and the species and what the extinction risk is. And it looks like there's a very tight correlation in figure A. Uh, for every species that is large, there is a high extinction risk. And for every species that's small, there's a low extinction risk. Hmm. Well, now look at uh, cladogram B, figure B. It's the same cladogram. But now what we're showing is, well, what if all the species in the top part of the cladogram, species A through K, were all large, all of them, and the species forming the clade on the bottom of the cladogram, B, D, F, H, J, L, they're all small. It's a different pattern. And now when we look at this, uh, the, the number of correlations disappear. They dissolve. Because the largeness, why are they all large? Well, they are all large because largeness came from a common ancestor, way in the early part of the cladogram. And so that's only one data point. It just became large once. And the fact that there's a high extinction risk for being large, that just originated one time. And we looked at that part of the cladogram where the species are all small. Same deal. They're all clustered together in the same part of the cladogram. Their extinction risk is low, but that's just one data point. They evolved smallness once. So anyway, there's a statistical method called phylogenetic, independent phylogenetic contrast that's able to detect whether these correlations between characteristics are significantly are statistically significant or not whether the correlations can be explained by phylogeny or if they're being explained by some ecological relationship. So let's look uh, down at the bottom part of the slide. It's showing you how this kind of um, uh, phy independent phylogenetic contrast is conducted. So we make comparisons, I'm at the second bullet point here, between nodes and the tips of the cladograms, making sure no part of the tree is used more than once. That's to make sure that we have independent data points for our statistics. We calculate the difference in each trait, in each pairwise comparison, and we set up a data matrix of those comparisons. And then finally, we plot the differences in a graph and test for correlations, see if there's a correlation between these traits or not. So let's take this uh, bottom figure and work through it as an example. So we have two different traits, trait X and trait Y. So we have a series of numbers for trait X for the different species, like species A, X, the value of X is 20. Species B, the value of X is 24, okay? Then we have trait Y, maybe that's the extinction risk or something. So for species A, the value is seven. For species B, the value is nine. These are things that we would measure from these species. <clears throat> so the difference between uh, species A and B in their X value is four right? Because uh, B is a value of 24, species A is a value of 20, so the difference between those tips is 4. Look at the uh, table in the middle of the bottom diagram, and it shows you uh, the distance, D1, between species A and B uh, is 4. So underneath X is 4, so that's that difference. How about the difference in the trait value for Y? between species A and B. Species A has a value of seven for trait Y, and species B has a value of nine. So the difference between those is two. You can see that in that um, di uh, box, that matrix. So now look at D2. What is D2? D2 is the difference between the values of the traits for species C and D, okay? So C has a trait value of 40, and D has a trait value of 30. So the difference uh, between those is 10. You can see that in the box. How about trait Y? Species C has a value of 20, species uh, D a value of 14. So that is a difference of six. You can see that in the, in the box. Finally, 
What is D3? D3 is the difference in trait value between those two lineages. And so how do we get those values of so 13 and 9? Well, we get the average for species A and B, and that goes at node E. So what's the average in trait X between 20 and 24? Well, the average would be 22. So E, that node, would have a value of 22. Keep that in mind. How about the node for F? What's the average of 40 and 30? It's 35. So we have for node E, a value of 22. For node F, we have a value of 35. What's the difference between 22 and 35? It's 13. See that in the box, in the matrix, in the middle? 13. Do the same thing for trait Y. So we get this data matrix that's showing the, the differences in trait values for these different points in the cladogram. Now we can take that information, we can take that data of differences, a uh, table of independent contrasts, and plot them. And that's what you can see in the graph. So we plot them and we see that it forms a nice neat line. So that tells us, that suggests to us, that there is a tight correlation between these two traits. That they are essentially evolving together. There's a relationship between them. So we can look for relationships between traits in an evolutionary tree by using this independent phylogenetic contrast method. And uh, uh, it's a way to, like I said, test hypotheses for correlations between traits. So how do fossils come into all this? Uh, we've talked about fossils a bit already and the importance of fossils. We keep discovering new ones. So for one thing, we can use fossils to estimate evolutionary timing. Because otherwise, if we're just looking at a bunch of living species, things, species that are around today, and we find their evolutionary relationships by doing a phylogenetic analysis, we can't know how long ago those species shared common ancestors, the nodes on the diagram. But when we discover fossils and we figure out how fossils fit into the phylogeny, they can provide evidence for us. They can provide information for us as to when certain common ancestors may have existed. So figure A depicts the relationships among five extant living species. So when did the branching occur? You know, that diagram doesn't show you any information about when the branching occurred. We can't know by just looking at the living species. How long ago did the common ancestors live at the nodes? Figure B incorporates in a fossil, an extinct species that we're calling F. And of course, we can estimate the age of species F using radiometric dating. So we can know with some confidence how old species F is. So once we put species F into the cladogram, we now can understand a little bit more about timing. Such that, hey, we know that at node Y, that common ancestor has to be older than species F, because species F came from that common ancestor. So now we know that that, that common ancestor is minimally 50 million years old. At least that. We don't know how old exactly, but at least that old. Can we draw any conclusions about, um, for example, the age of X or the age of Z? Those nodes, those are a little more difficult. Spe uh, figure C and D are kind of showing us two possibilities there. So we know F. F is 50 million years old, so that's you know, being shown in the same place in each cladogram. But in figure C, it's showing, well, maybe common ancestor Z is pretty young. You know, it's shoved way over there on the right-hand side of the cladogram. We can't know with the information at hand. Maybe common ancestor Z is really old. So that's in figure D. Z is shoved over in the left part of the cladogram. Again, we can't know with the evidence that we have. We have to have more fossils uh, 
uh, that are you know related to A, B, and C to help us figure that out. So the more fossils we have to incorporate into a phylogeny, the better handle we can have on when past events occurred. So we've talked about how to interpret a cladogram, the different parts, to understand the different parts and what they're showing us. Uh, I've gone over with you how a cladogram is constructed. We've got to identify characters and character states for the species we're interested in. We have to look at the character, character states of outgroups, closely related species, arrange those in a data matrix, find the most parsimonious cladogram, find the cladogram with the fewest number of steps. And we've just gone over uh, phylogenetic contrast. We've gone over an incorporation of fossils. Well, now let's look at a case study of how we can test hypotheses with phylogeny. So now once we have a phylogeny, there's a whole variety of questions that we might be able to answer um, using these phylogenies. Now we can only gain limited insights by studying just extant lineages, living lineages. As you're starting to see here, fossils are extremely important. So if we look at the evolutionary relationships of uh, tetrapods, us, amphibians, reptiles, and mam mammals, to fishes, the living fishes, we have ray fin fishes and we have lobe fin fishes like coelacanths, then you know there's information there. We, we can tell that we are more closely related to a coelacanth. We have a bone structure in our arms and our legs that is most similar to the bone structure in the fins of a coelacanth. And that bone structure is uniquely shared between us and the coelacanth. The ray fin fishes have a different bone structure. <clears throat> but uh, we can understand much more about the evolution of our limbs from fins if we can discover and include fossils and include those fossils into our phylogeny so we can see the sequence of events. So how do we find these intermediates? I mean, if we're interested in uh, discovering a particular intermediate in the, in the uh, tree of life, how do we know where to look, where to go? Well, one of the keys here is we have to go to strata. We have to go to rocks that are the correct age. And we have to go to uh, rocks uh, that uh, formed in the appropriate environment. So if we're interested in the evolution of fish and aquatic organisms, then we've got to look at fossils that existed in aquatic environments, not desert environments. So we got to know where to look. And this is where knowledge about geology is particularly important. So we do this and we find, for example, that there's a fossil that was discovered um, well over 100 years ago called Eusthenopteron. It was also a lobe fin fish and it has characteristics that are uh, more similar to us, tetrapods. So it was a lobe fin fish but it was a little more closely related to us. So there we go, Eusthenopteron is telling us something. This creature called Tiktaalik was just discovered uh, about 16 years ago in the Canadian Arctic. And it was discovered because the biologist that found it went to the appropriately aged rocks in the appropriate environment they knew what they wanted to look for. They went to the right place on Earth and they were lucky enough to find a fossil intermediate that was really close to tetrapods and they called it Tiktaalik. So for example, Tiktaalik had wrist bones like we do, but it didn't have any digits. It didn't have any fingers and toes. Uh, Tiktaalik uh, had a pelvis that you know, the rear fins are attached to, but it didn't have a connection of the pelvis to the spinal cord, so it wasn't very rigidly connected. So Tiktaalik had characteristics that are uniquely shared with us tetrapods that 
Tiktaalik didn't share with other fish, lobefin fish. So uh, there's more information. Acanthostega was discovered in the 1990s and uh, it's about 365 million years old and it had digits. Now let's look at the map that's down the bottom left hand corner. How did biologists know where to look for Tiktaalik? Tiktaalik is about 370 million years old. So the biologists that went and looked and found Tiktaalik, they knew they had to go look at the right age of rocks, like I mentioned, and the right environment. 370 million years old is what their target was in an environment that's kind of like coastal marsh, um, uh, estuaries, you know, shallow marshy areas. And there were three places that were uh, that they identified. Eastern North America, you can see, like Pennsylvania, New York, uh, and then way up there in the Arctic, the dark red areas. Well, they first looked in the Appalachian Mountains there, like in Pennsylvania, but the problem was it's too forested and it's too difficult to look for fossils there. So they decided to go up to the Canadian Arctic and um, wide open tundra where it's easy to look for fossils. And lo and behold, they found what they were looking for. So our cladogram here is now showing a, a bigger, more robust picture of how we understand that tetrapods evolved from lobe fin fish because we have a more complete fossil record and we're able to include these fossils in our phylogenetic analysis identifying characters and character states that we can include in a data matrix so this figure shows a more complete story again by incorporating fossils so look at the character state transitions, the little marks on the cladogram. Those little marks, by the way, are called synapomorphies. Syn means shared, apo means unique, and morphy or morph means form or condition. So shared, unique, condition, synapomorphy. So if you look at the very top of that cladogram, for example, there's a synapomorphy for all the fish lineages that are depicted going back more than 400 million years. Bony skeleton, lungs. So those are uniquely evolved traits, synapomorphies that all those fish and us share. Then you look on the cladogram just below that, lobe fin. Single large bone and fin attached to shoulder girdle. Well, the ray fin fish don't have that, but all the other fish do, and so do we, so do us. So that's a synapomorphy for that part of the cladogram. So if you look carefully at this cladogram, you can see we have a better picture for the evolution of our limbs and uh, other uh, anatomical characteristics. And we also have a timeline because we're able to date these fossils so we know where in the, this evolutionary history these things popped up. Now there's a very famous anatomist by the name of Alfred uh, Romer uh, in the last century who uh, came up with a hypothesis that tetrapods evolved uh, 350, you know, 50, 60 million years ago in response to severe drought because in the Devonian period, the geologic record, uh, we can see that there were severe droughts in the Devonian. So this was his thinking. Uh, but this phylogeny now helps us to test Romer's hypothesis. It turns out the species that were at the transition between fish and tetrapod, they were living in environments that weren't drying up. They were uh, living in environments that were more stable with water, like you know, coastal uh, river regions and so on. So we're able to exclude or reject that hypothesis of roamers because now we have a phylogeny that shows us the transition and we know the environments from the fossil record that these uh, species lived in. So, so far throughout this whole chapter, uh, we've been showing these uh, branching diagrams, these dichotomously branching diagrams, these forked diagrams, and that's our um, concept of how evolution has occurred over time is through branching. 
continuous branching of new lineages, new species, and this is called vertical evolution. And vertical evolution may predominate amongst most eukaryotes, especially plants and animals and so on, especially multicellular forms. Uh, however, there's a lot of life on Earth that um, doesn't just show vertical evolution, but also shows horizontal evolution, horizontal gene transfer. So prokaryotes, like bacteria and archaea, are pretty good at sharing genes are pretty good at taking up genes from other bacteria or archaeans and incorporating those genes into their own genome. So that's not vertical evolution. That's not from a common ancestor, you know, and through reproduction up through the tree, but that's from one lineage over to another lineage. That's horizontal evolution. You can see that on this diagram. So for example, chloroplasts originated in eukaryotes because of horizontal uh, gene transfer. Basically, a, a, a photosynthetic bacteria started living inside of some eukaryotic cells and became a chloroplast. That's horizontal transfer. The same thing for mitochondria, even earlier in our eukaryotic history. That's horizontal transfer. So the, the, the main point here is, is for you to understand that evolution is, is not just branching in a vertical way, but evolution also has included horizontal transfer of genetics uh, from one lineage to another, especially in the prokaryotic world. So we've covered enough about phylogeny, evolutionary history, to be able to tackle this topic. Sometimes people refer to species as being primitive or advanced, for example. That's language that I heard quite a bit as an up-and-coming biology student several decades ago. Uh, biologists used to use that language quite a bit. Uh, primitive, advanced. Uh, the problem is, is that these kinds of terms are rooted in pre-evolutionary thinking. And uh, so these are terms that we should give up and not use anymore because they're conveying uh, thoughts that aren't supported by evidence. So, for example, platypuses have been called primitive because they lay eggs. They lay shelled eggs as mammals and all the rest of mammals uh, don't lay shelled eggs, but they incubate their embryos in a uterus. So uh, not only is this connotation of primitive kind of left over from thinking of life as like ladder-like, things farther down are primitive and things farther up are advanced, higher and lower life forms, but really what we should be focused on is not the whole organism as being primitive, but the specific characteristic or character. And in fact, that, that term primitive, because it has a con connotation of being inferior, lower, we don't even want to use that term anymore. Don't even use it. Don't use the term primitive as a biologist. Instead, we re refer to characteristics or traits that existed earlier in a phylogeny, not as primitive, but as ancestral, ancestral, and more recent traits as being derived. So this is giving uh, 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 descriptions of these traits that's more rooted in our understanding of evolution. So platypuses, as a matter of fact, might have some traits that are ancestral, like they lay shelled eggs, and they also, say for example, don't have nipples. So when they're feeding their young milk, there's no nipples. So those would be ancestral traits. But in fact, platypuses are, are also loaded with a lot of derived traits that the rest of us mammals don't have. So that, that bill that they have for being called a duck-billed platypus is, is actually a, a very complex sensory organ for uh, swimming around underwater and detecting electrical signals from prey, uh, like buried in the mud and the sand. Uh, well, that's a derived condition. We're not calling that an advanced condition, but that's, that's a derived condition. That's a pretty special condition. They also have um, uh, venom 
They, uh, males have spurs on their feet that can deliver venom. Well, that's unique in the mammal world, so that's a derived condition. Uh, so it's much more useful to refer to these conditions uh, as derived or ancestral. Give up on the primitive language. Don't use the language of primitive. It's outdated and it's conveying the wrong messages. So here, again, we're using phylogeny to answer questions about evolutionary history. So that's where we are in this chapter, is how can we use phylogeny to answer questions about evolutionary history? And uh, homology provides a window into evolutionary history. Remember what homology is. Homology is the concept that two or more species share a trait because it came from a common ancestor. The trait is homologous if it came from a common ancestor. So all of us mammals, including the duck-billed platypus, have uh, little tiny bones in our ears. It's called our middle ear. And those little bones are evolutionarily unique. In particular, mammals have uh, unique bones called the malleus and the incus. The stapes is part of the middle ear too, but that's a bone that evolved in the common ancestor of mammals, reptiles, and amphibians when fish were moving out onto land. So the stapes goes farther back. So we're more focused or interested here on the malleus and in the incus. What are their origins? Where do these tiny little bones come from? Because reptiles don't have them in their ears. Amphibians don't have them. Where do they come from? To which earlier ancestral structures are they homologous? They have to be tied to some pre-existing condition, some pre-existing bones. Where do they come from? Well, we turn to fossils. So this creature called Dimetrodon that looked like a dinosaur, but was not, it's very distant and related. There's a picture of a Dimetrodon head uh, on the right-hand side of your slide. This creature is about 350 million years old, and it's part of a major group in the phylogeny of animals called synapsids. And we are part of that group. We are part of this big evolutionary grouping called synapsids. Now, Dimetrodon was a stem lineage. That means that it's a lineage that's not part of living species uh, when extinct, and it's very close to the common ancestor of all the amniotes, the mammals, the reptiles, uh, the mammals and the reptiles. So stem lineages can be very important and useful for us to look at for the origins of characteristics because they branched off very far back in evolutionary history, a stem lineage. Now Dimetrodon had a lower jaw structure that is very representative of the pre-mammal condition. In fact, it's very similar to what reptiles had. So Dimetrodon had a lower jaw with lots of bones in it. In fact, here's a picture showing Dimetrodon. Uh, have the blue bone is called the angular, and that's not even in a mammal jaw, jaw anymore. The whitish bone uh, primarily is the dentary, and that is the one bone that's still in our mammal lower jaw. And then there are a couple other bones depicted there, the quadrate uh, and the articular. And those are part of the jaw joint that's also found in reptiles and amphibians. Now, in a mammal, like an opossum, the lower jaw is only made of, up of the dentary. You can see that on the very bottom diagram. And the ear has um, the uh, articular bone and the quadrate bone have become little bones in the ear for delivering sounds. So how did this happen? How did this happen? Phylogeny and evolutionary history can help reveal the story. So let's take a look. But there is a connection, the homology between the tiny bones in our middle ears and these jaw bones. And we can see that connection. We can understand that homology by looking at fossils and other sources of information. Let's take a look. So, uncovering middle ear homology. That's what we're after. 
these little tiny ear bones, these little tiny bones that are in our ears, where do they come from? So here's a phylogeny shown on the left hand side of the slide, and it includes a lot of fossils. Again, the importance of fossils. So there's Dimetrodon, a stem synapsid, branching off very early in our whole big synapsid phylogeny. And you can see the position of the articular, which is pink, the quadrate, which is green. See the angular bone there that isn't a big part of our story, and the dentary, which is whitish. And as you look up through that phylogeny uh, and travel up through it, you can see the bones are changing. You can see the dentary is becoming more and more prominent, is taking up more and more of the lower jaw. And the other bones are disappearing or moving and becoming smaller. And eventually, we can see that the articular and the quadrate, that pink and that green bone, they break off from the lower jaw joint area and they physically move into the ear area. And that's what happens in monotremes and their relatives, like us uh, other mammals called therians. And so we can see in the fossil record the transitions of these bones and the movement of the quadrate and the articular bone into the jaw joint area. So we can establish the homology, the connection of these middle ear bones to the jaw bones through the fossil record and the phylogeny. Now look on the right hand side of the slide. It's showing you embryonic development of an opossum a marsupial, an embryo. And what we see is very early on in the embryos, those articular and quadrate bones are connected to the dentary. They're connected to the lower jaw bone that's developing. But uh, later on that in that embryo, you get to uh, days 15, 21, 30, etc. Those bones essentially uh, disconnect from the jaw and they're only found in the middle ear. So we can also see in embryos this transition. The embryos begin with those uh, ear bones connected to the jaw, just like in our ancestors. And as the embryos develop, those bones move into a new location. So we can see both through fossils and through embryonic development, we can trace the homology of those middle ear bones. So we just looked at a case study of mammals and the middle ear bones in mammals uh, to see how we can use phylogeny to establish homology. Now, here's a term on the slide, exaptation. And exaptation is a trait that evolves in one context, in one environment, and then it evolves for a different context as a different adaptation. That kind of a trait is called an exaptation. So we can think of it as like a borrowed trait. So the middle ear bones in mammals are an exaptation because they originally evolved in the context of being as a jaw joint, and then they got modified those bones to become ear bones for hearing better. So here, when we look at dinosaur phylogeny, and we're interested in the evolution of feathers, and when feathers evolved, and what the original um, uh, function of feathers was, we then encounter this concept of exaptation again. What was the original function of feathers? Well, what we can see developmentally, and through the fossil record is that feathers are modified scales from reptiles. So they indeed represent an exaptation because scales had an original function of covering and protecting the body. And then when some of those scales were modified into feathers, they now have a different function besides covering and protecting the body. So what was the nature of the original feathers on dinosaurs? Were they for flight? Were they for flying or doing something else? Well, we can see phylogenetically birds belong to a group of dinosaurs called theropods that includes Tyrannosaurus rex and uh, um, Velociraptors and things like that. A pretty big group of dinosaurs. 
And we now have a good enough fossil record that we can see that feathers evolved uh, fairly early on in these theropod dinosaurs. But these feathers weren't used for flying. They couldn't have. They weren't flight feathers, but they were found on these dinosaurs' bodies. So that means these feathers may have evolved for something like insulation, keep them warm, or maybe display, like for sexual selection. Uh, but nonetheless, we can see from the phylogeny that feathers did not evolve for flying. They evolved for one of these other functions. And we can see that feathers are an exaptation. They, in this sense, they evolved in the original context of, say, insulation or signaling behavior, and then got co-opted and evolved into structures for flying. So feathers, in fact, show a number of different transitions in this exaptation category, beginning as reptilian scales and then ending up as being used for flight. And to finish up here on our feather story, uh, so some of these dinosaurs had feathers, but they couldn't fly. So, for example, the ulna, one of the lower arm bones here, the ulna of a velociraptor uh, is being shown in the figure on the upper right. And what we can see looking closely at that ulna is that there's little bumps, little bumps that are of the same form and in the same location as little bumps that we see on the ulna of a bird, like a turkey vulture, figures D, E, and F. And those little bumps on a turkey vulture's ulna originate from the attachment of feathers to the ulna. So now we see those same little bumps on the ulna of a velociraptor, although we don't see feathers on that ulna, we see the little bumps, it might lead us to the hypothesis that in fact velociraptors had feathers attached to their ulna, not for flying, but for something else, maybe display. The bottom figure is showing a uh, fossil bird, early bird-like uh, dinosaur called Cynornithosaurus, and it couldn't fly. We, can, we know that from its anatomy. It couldn't flap its arms or wings and fly, but it could glide. And uh, anyway, we uh, can see that there's fossilized nesting behavior in these uh, dinosaurs, these bird-like dinosaurs. And so that suggests an incubation function, that maybe the feathers originally evolved to help incubate eggs and keep them warm. We certainly see that in modern birds when they're sitting on their eggs and nests and keeping them warm, the feathers help insulate. So again, we can use fossils and phylogeny to answer questions like this for the original function of feathers.